Zechariah, chapter 4. <clears throat> I, uh, I text Brother John the passage to read today and he sends back a text message about another verse of Scripture somewhere else and wondering how this was going to fit in with that, which is a totally different subject <laughs> altogether. So uh, he's tried to steer me away on a tangent. So, uh, but uh, amen. Thank you, Brother John, for reading. Our theme for this year, though we don't have the banner up yet, should be ready for next week, is uh, 2020 vision. So we want to focus this year on, on, on vision and, and seeing and seeing clearly. And of course, we want to always keep the Lord before our eyes. But something that, uh, that the angel of the Lord said to Zechariah in verse number two, he said, and he said unto me, what seest thou? What seest thou? So we're going to look at that this morning from this patch of scripture. What seest thou? I'm going to give a little bit of a, I guess, a background to this and then we'll make application uh, for us today. So let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get into the message. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Lord, thank you for our friends, our visitors that are here. We pray that you would bless them, bless the Gillam family as they head back to Townsville. Give them travelling mercies, we pray. Thank you for Jerome being with us today. Bless him abundantly, we pray. And Lord, as we look into the scriptures this morning, we ask, Holy Spirit of God, that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, you know I have nothing to say. And Lord, you have everything to say. And so I pray, God, as I yield myself to you, that you would just use me this morning to speak to us as far as what you want us to know this morning. And so challenge our hearts, we pray. Bless us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I, I love the Old Testament. I know we're New Testament saints, but I, I love the Old Testament. And I think one of the keys about reading through the Old Testament is not just looking at it from a historical point of view, though, though that's there, and we'll look at that in a minute. I guess, but the other thing is this, is to be able to take something from the Old Testament and, and make it an application for us today. And, and I like that about the Old Testament. And, uh, and we can do that with most passages now. We understand that in the Old Testament, a lot of things are written uh, to Israel, but all of us are written, it's all written to us for our learning, for our admonition. So as we read the book of Zechariah, we know that Zechariah was a prophet, and he was actually a prophet that worked alongside of the prophet Haggai in the days of Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel was a man who, along with about 46,000 others, came out of captivity of Babylon there, or the Medes and Persians, at that time, they went from the Babylonian captivity with Nebuchadnezzar, then the Medes and the Persians took over. They'd come out. We know that Nehemiah was the man that God used to build the wall of Jerusalem. Uh, Ezra was a teaching priest, and he was also, uh, along with Zerubbabel, uh, given the instruction to build the temple. And, uh, and what happened was, is, is back in the day of Zerubbabel, as he's building it, they've, la they've laid the foundation and the enemies rose up and, and they had said to them and that they, they frustrated their purpose. And we might look at that a little bit later as the Lord leads. They frustrated their purpose and they had stopped rebuilding the temple. They laid the foundation. It was all very exciting, but they had stopped it. And then the prophets came on the scene. Haggai and Zechariah encouraged the people, stirred the hearts of the people. And they got back together rebuilding it. It was an amazing thing. Uh, the glory of the latter house was better than the, the glory of the first house. And... And all of that is in the book of, of Haggai. So uh, Zechariah now has been given a vision and asked the question, challenged with the question of, of what do you see? And he sees this golden candlestick and, and the whole picture of it is a, is a, is a, a beautiful picture in and of itself of, of what's taking place or what's going to take place as far as the rebuilding of the temple. It was a very beautiful building, there's no doubt about it. The one that Solomon built was so magnificent, even the Queen of Sheba was breathless at what she saw. Uh, that got destroyed, obviously, it was rebuilt again, and, and now, that, now it's got Herod's temple, which is in Jerusalem at the moment. Uh, so so Zechariah has been given this message, uh, this vision, what, what seest thou? And uh, he said, I see this golden candlestick, and, and isn't it interesting that when he looked, he saw the golden candlestick. Sometimes we look at things, but don't actually see what we're looking at. Right. And he saw, he saw the big picture, if you please, but he didn't actually see what God was wanting him to see, because he says in verse number six, then he answered and spake, this is the word of the Lord under his under rubble was saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. So, so God is saying to Zerubbabel, look, it's, it's not through your might and power, but it's through my spirit that these things are going to take place. 
that was the uh, that was the picture that God wanted him to see. So as we as we look at this this whole scenario of what's taking place in Zerubbabel's life, I can't help but think that the parallel or the application that we see here can also be brought over into a New Testament church. The reason why I say that is because, let me read these verses to you in Revelation 1, 12. Jesus said this, he says, I turned to see the voice that spake with me. John said, he said of Jesus, I turned to the voice that spake with me and being turned, he said, I saw seven golden candlesticks. In Revelation 1, 20, he says, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So, in Jesus' day, as Jesus gives John this revelation, he sees the seven candlesticks and the seven angels. The seven angels are the, the angels to the churches or, or the pastors or the prophets, if you will, to the churches. And the seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches at that time of Asia Minor. And so the, the application that we can make for us as far as what thou seest is I could ask you the question today is, is what do you see? in regards to a local church what do you see in regards to what the lord jesus christ is doing because a golden candlestick in revelation is a picture of the church here we see the golden candlestick in, in relation to the temple but there's an application that we can make for that today and and i want to ask you the question what is it in 2020 that you're going to see in regards to church I, I, I love a local New Testament church. I make no bones about that. I, I, I love the local church. I think it's a great place to belong. It's a great place to come. I actually don't believe there's any substitute for it. The Lord Jesus Christ, I believe in his earthly ministry, uh, began the local New Testament church. In Acts chapter 2, I believe he empowered the local New Testament church. And then from then on, what we see in the book of Acts is we see an empowered people carrying out uh, the purpose of God. And that purpose is still being carried out today. It's not by our might, it's not by our power, but it's by His Spirit. Amen. If we're going to do anything that's lasting for the Lord, it can't be done in your might, in your power, or my might, my power. It's got to be done by His Spirit. And therefore, we've got to make sure that the Holy Spirit of God is, is a person who is actively working, not just in us as an individual, but working consistently in Christ's church. But what seest thou? What do you see when it comes to a New Testament church? I want to give you four quick things if I could this morning and you can write them down if you like. But I see this. What we should see is we should see that the church is precious. And I say that because it's a golden candlestick. Uh, in Zechariah's time, we see a golden candlestick, all of, uh, a candlestick all of gold, the bowl upon the top of it, the seven lamps, the seven pipes, and the olive trees. And all of those are very important and very necessary when it comes to a local New Testament church today. But I say it's precious because it's, it's viewed as being gold. And gold is one of the most precious metals that can be uh, uh, refined or mined today or dug for today. Uh, if you had the choice, ladies, of having a gold necklace or a brass necklace, which one would you go for? The gold. There's no substitute for gold. I mean, nobody wants, you know, if you want a gold ring or a, or a silver ring or a brass ring. Everyone looks at gold and they think, wow, look at that. Gold is so precious. It's so beautiful. And, and, and not only did God in Zechariah's day liken to what he was doing as far as the temple being gold, Jesus likened the seven churches or the church today as being gold. And therefore, in Christ's eyes, his church is precious. And we're not talking about a building. We're not talking about even this building. We know that the church today is made up of people. Amen. So he sees you as precious. He sees his church as being precious. I want to ask you the question, do you see what Jesus sees? Do you see this church or the church that you belong to? Do you see what Jesus sees and sees it as being precious? There is no substitute, I believe, for gold. Now, we won't turn there, but we'll go back further. In the days of Solomon, when Solomon was building everything that he was building... He built all these golden shields that he put in the temple and in the house of God there. By the time Rehoboam ascends to the throne, 
Shishak, the king of Egypt, comes in and he takes all the golden shields out. But brainy old Rehoboam, what he thought he would do is he would make shields of brass to try and substitute for the golden shields. But there's no comparison. No. There's no substitute. Brass just doesn't have the same look. Brass doesn't have the same flair. Brass doesn't have the same glory. The sa it just doesn't glow like gold does. And so in our life, there's nothing really, folks, that can be compared to a local New Testament church. There's no substitute for it. That's right. I love listening to preaching. I was listening to preaching the other day. I was, I was listening to a young evangelist over in the, in, in the States. His name's uh, Caleb Garraway. And, and I just come across it and I, and I listened to it and I got, man, this is really good. And I love listening to preaching. Uh, you know, I, 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 I love perhaps even visiting churches that, that are having live stream services. Most of the times it's from the state. And by the time we get that, it's Monday or whatever it is. We can, we can like, but do you understand that there's no substitute than being in the house of God. Amen. There's no substitute. It's, it's good to listen to perhaps audio books. It's good to read books. It's good to listen to preaching online. And, and all of those things are helpful. And all of those things are good. But it's no substitute. Right. Amen. Jesus started his church for a reason. And what we see unfolding here in the book of Zechariah is something that we can bring over into a New Testament church and think, you know what, we need to see that in our church. Even in Heritage Baptist Church this year, we ought to be praying and desiring what we see in Zechariah chapter 4 in our life today. So the first thing is that we ought to see that it's precious. There's no substitute for it. Now, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter says this, he says, To us who believe, he being Jesus is precious. And isn't the Lord Jesus Christ precious? Do you Amen. believe that Jesus is precious? Amen. Is Jesus Christ precious to you? Amen. I mean, he ought to be precious to us, right? And we see that Jesus is precious. But hang on a second. You, you, can't, you can't take Jesus and see Jesus as precious... And not see his body as precious. And his body is the church. Amen. His body is the church. You, Jesus and his body are inseparable. You, <laughs> you can't just take the head and leave the body. That's just gross. That's just weird. That's unnatural, right? You say, well, how do you see that? In Acts chapter 9... We won't turn there for the sake of time. In Acts chapter 9, when Paul was on the road to Damascus, he encounters Jesus, right? And Jesus says to Saul, 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 why persecutest thou me? Jesus speaking. So Jesus is questioning Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus. When Paul recounts what's happening on the road to Damascus in 1 Corinthians 15 and in Galatians 1.13, in those scriptures, he says that he persecuted the church and wasted it. So was he persecuting Christ or was he persecuting the church? Oh, no. Both. Yes. Both. Because you can't separate, can you? And yet we separate every time. We, we love Jesus and we think Jesus is precious. But if we love Jesus and we think Jesus is precious, then everything that's precious to Jesus should be precious in our life. Amen. Everything that Jesus deems as precious should be precious for us. But what we do today in the 21st century is that, that we think that we can love Jesus. And by the way, we can worship the Lord Monday through to Saturday. Sunday is not just the day of worship. We get to worship seven days a week. But on one day a week, it's been set aside where we assemble together as a body of believers and worship as a body of believers and sing unto the Lord and hear the preaching. And there's no substitute for any of that. Oh, man. It's precious to Christ and it should be precious to us. So when Jesus said to Paul, why are you persecuting me? And when Paul recounts and says, I persecuted the church, it's both because you can't separate Christ from his church. So but what do you see? 
what seest thou? Hold your place in Zechariah. Would you go to Acts chapter 2, please? Acts chapter 2. Now, we're talking about a, 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 a church of gold, right? <laughs> I don't know if you remember. I, I hate bringing this into it, but I'm going to do it anyway because I'm there. Do you remember years ago, the footy show, the NRL footy show, not the AFL footy show, when uh, uh, there was Paul Vorton and the Chief was on and... And they had, this, uh, they had this segment called That's Gold. Do you remember that? And everyone would be going around, that's gold, that's gold. Well, I liken this church to that's gold. And have a look at Acts chapter 2 and look at verse number 41. He says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So there was about 3,000 people added to something that was already assembling, which was the 120, the Lord's church that he began on this earth, right? So about 3,000 people were added to this church, all right, through them being saved and baptized and added. Look at verse number 42. And they continued steadfastly. Now, I like that. I tell you what I, what I see in, in, in ministry in the years is that when people first get saved or they find a church that they really enjoy, nothing can keep them away. That's right. They're just there, man. Oh, this is so exciting. This is so great. It's something new. Oh, I love my church. Oh, I'm getting something every week. And oh, just the, the groups that I'm a part of, this is so good. And, and for those who have been in a wilderness and have found a church that meets their needs and everything's so good. And, and, and for a season, they continue steadfastly until something takes place. Or they grow tired. Or they grow weary. And they no longer are steadfast or continuing steadfastly. Can I say to you that what we ought to have a vision for in 2020 is to continue steadfastly in an organisation or an, uh, not an institution, because when I think of an institution, I think of a mental institution. <laughs> and I'm sure there's some mental patients in our institution here. I'm sure of it, <laughs> me being one of them. But anyway, it, it's an organism. It's growing. And, and we ought to have a vision of being involved in something that Christ deems as precious. Continue, continue steadfastly. Now look at what they continue steadfastly in. Number one, doctrine. The apostles' doctrine. And we heard that this morning. Listen, doctrine is everything. The, 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 uh, the, the faith that was once delivered, we heard in Jude. Who delivered that faith? Who delivered that? Whose doctrine ought we be following? Jesus Christ, his doctrine, Amen. that's what we continue steadfastly in. So when you hear out there, well, doctrine divides, let's not major on doctrine. Let's not listen. That's not a scriptural premise because everything we believe comes from this book that's been written. Everything that we believe comes from the Lord Jesus Christ, his doctrine, his doctrine is precious to him. Amen. And we have no business in changing his doctrine. But there are doctrines many, isn't there? Brother, Sh uh, Brother, Sh Brother Marsh said it this morning. Uh, that if there weren't so many doctrines, there wouldn't be so many denominations. And every denomination has this doctrine or that doctrine and this doctrine and that doctrine, including Baptists. <laughs> uh, we're not going to remove ourselves out of that. We're going to put ourselves in the mix because I don't know about you, but... A lot of Baptist churches have a lot of different things that they believe. So they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. Isn't that amazing? I love that. And then it says this, and fear came upon every soul. Now that fear is not a phobia. Remember last week I said we shouldn't have a phobia about Jesus Christ, but we ought to have a healthy respect and reverence for so when what's taking place here, as these souls are added, they've got this, they've got doctrine, they've got fellowship, they've got breaking of bread, and they've got prayers. And every believer needs that. And as we engage in that, there ought to be a healthy reverence and respect for Jesus Christ. Now look at this, fear come upon every soul. Now I'm going to explain this in a minute. And he says this, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. I don't want to get caught up in this wonders and signs, but let me just say to you what signs and wonders or wonders and signs are. They are a demonstration of his power. Good. 
I'm not advocating gold dust. I'm not advocating teeth being made into gold. I'm not advocating any of that. But what I am advocating for in a church that is precious to Jesus and a church that should be precious to us is that there should be a, a demonstration of the Lord's power in his body. Right. It ought to be that. Verse 44, and all they that believed were together. So there's this togetherness and had all things common, sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men. There was generosity as every man had need. Verse 46, and they continuing daily in one accord in the temple, breaking of bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. That's gold. Amen. <laughs> That's gold. Notice, notice the type of church that Jesus adds to. This church where there's the apostles' doctrine or the Lord's doctrine, there's doctrine there, there's fellowship, there's breaking of bread, there's prayers, there's reverence, there's respect, uh, there's togetherness, there's generosity, there's power being demonstrated. Folks, can I say to you that that is a healthy New Testament church? Yes. But what seest thou? What seest thou? Secondly, let's go back to Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 4. So what, see, what we should see is we should see church as being precious. Precious. I was flicking through Jerome's Bible, his new Bible, and I was just flicking through it. And he's got highlighted in uh, Hebrews, Hebrews 10, I think it is. Hebrews 10, 23, 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. I want to encourage you in 2020 that you would do your utmost to be faithful, to continue steadfastly yes, amen. in the house of God, in something that's precious to the Lord. Now, I want you to go to verse number six. This is the other thing that we should see. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit saith the Lord. We ought to see the importance of God's spirit in the church. Amen. God's spirit. I tell you, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. What an amazing, I love it. I love it. I love it. But what an abused doctrine. Right. I mean, if you were to think about the pendulum, you've got the extremism over here and then you've got where, that, where, it, where it's all about that. And like I said, signs and wonders and gifts and and, and all of that, but then you've got the other extreme where you can't even, even mention or preach or talk about the Holy Spirit. Both are extremes, both are wrong. There needs to be a balance. That's right. There needs to be a balance. The Holy Spirit of God, that we ought to see the importance of the Spirit of God in our services, moving in our hearts, moving in our life, drawing people. Listen, I can't get people to church. I can invite, but it's the spirit that draws people. Amen. You can invite and don't stop inviting. Don't stop witnessing. Don't get discouraged when people don't get saved or they acknowledge you. But just be a witness and let the spirit of God draw people in. And let him do his work. Now, notice something also. Look at verse number seven. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings crying, Grace, grace unto it. Do you know that grace is not just a New Testament thing? Grace has always been around. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Yes, amen. The Holy Spirit is known as a spirit of grace, according to Hebrews chapter 10. Grace is what we need. Grace is what we have. Grace is what we need more of. That's right. But like we saw this morning, we don't use that grace for an occasion to the flesh. What is grace? To me, grace is like the fruit of the Spirit. You've got different aspects. Love, joy, peace. Grace, grace is the favour, the life, the power, and the ability of God. All of those things encompass what grace is all about. So if we're going to see the importance of the Holy Spirit, we ought to see the importance of the spirit of grace in our life and church. Amen. The spirit of grace brings God's power, brings his strength, brings his might. Everything we do, it's, as we said, it's not by spirit, uh, it's not by might, not by power, but by his spirit. We ought to be relying upon the Holy Spirit of God in our lives and the life of our church. Right. 
shame. Which is why the Bible says not to grieve. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. According to Ephesians 4.30, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God until you're sealed under the day of redemption. Also, don't quench. 1 Thessalonians 5.19, quench not the Spirit. And of course, we all understand what the term quench means. It means to put out. The Holy Spirit of God ought to be the fire in our life, ought to be the fire of our church. You see, something that, that Zachariah saw, he saw the shell, he saw the golden candlestick, but he didn't see the engine room. He didn't see the powerhouse, the power plant that is associated with what was taking place in his day. And folks, can I say to you that we ought to see the, the power plant of God, which is the Holy Spirit of God, who ought to be filling this place and filling you as a believer and empowering you and setting you on fire. Thank you. But what we do oftentimes is we quench the spirit. Yeah. We douse it. We put it out. And then we wonder why that. It just doesn't seem to be that same. I don't see what's going on today. See, I don't see what's... When I read the book of Acts, I just don't see that happening today. And that's a fair enough question. Because when I do read through the book of Acts, and the Lord added daily unto the church, and I see what type of church was, was being assembled, and the power of God that was there, and everything that was taking place, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't always see that. But that doesn't mean the Bible is wrong and that doesn't mean that God is not doing something. We need to check our own hearts, our own lives. Have I grieved? Have I quenched the spirit in my home, in my life? Am I someone who is grieving the spirit in my church? Because it's the spirit of God that ought to be involved and working in our church. Now, talking about that, I want you to go to verse number, number 9. Not only should we see the importance of God's spirit, but we should see the value of the Lord. Now, watch this. The value of the Lord working with us. Notice in six, he says, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. And then he says in verse nine, he talks about the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. Let me just say this, though the hands of Zerubbabel was involved in the rebuilding of the temple, he was not doing it alone. The Lord God Almighty was at work with him. Now we've got to understand that, and this is very important in the day in which we live, because there are so many ways that you can build an institution or you can build something. Do you know, honestly speaking, if, if I was this minded and, and I'm not, if, if I was a, a businessman that had that business brain and all that sort, do you know that you could build a church based on business principles, statistics, all that sort of thing? But that doesn't mean the Lord's building it. That's, that's me employing what I know to build it. But if it's going to be any, have any value, if it's going to have any, any glory to it, the Lord Jesus Christ has got to be involved in the building of it. Amen. Do you know, uh, you're not building yourself, in a sense, but it's the Lord in you that's building you. Uh, your family. The Lord Jesus Christ ought to be actively involved in the building of your family. Because I know what thing, how things turn out when I build them. There's always parts left over. <laughs> what did that, where did that go? Oh, I've got this, oh, surely it's meant to, oh, don't worry about it. It'll be all right. <laughs> She'll be right, mate. And then down the track, whatever it is I built, whether it's for the, one of the kids when they were little or whatever, it's like, no wonder things fall apart and crash. <laughs> but that happens when a, a church is man-made. When a church is man-made, and let me just say something, when it comes to the climate of Christianity today, there are so many people leaving their church they've been in for a while and, and looking elsewhere, looking here, looking there, going here, going there, whatever it is, there, there's, there's people everywhere. Part of that, and it's not the whole reason, part of that is because what they've become involved in is, is a man-made organisation. 
It's got to be made of God. Hold your place in Zechariah. Can I give you two scriptures for it? Go to Mark 16 for a minute. Mark 16. And then we're going to go to Acts chapter 11. On the back of Mark 16's commission, Mark 16 verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they, the apostles, they went forth and preached everywhere. Now look at this. The Lord working with them. The Lord working with them. They didn't go off their own bat. They weren't, they weren't, you know, they, they, they were working with the Lord. I want you to go to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Acts 11. Look at verse 19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen travelled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Same deal. The Lord was working with. All right. So we see here, we see here the value of the Lord working with us. I shared this verse a while back and I've been, I've been dwelling on it. And I, except the Lord build the house, they labour in vain and build it. In other words, what's taking place is that the Lord and us should be working together. Right. If there's going to be any value, if there's going to be any strength, if there's going to be any glory to God, then he's got to be working it, building it through us. Amen. We're going to be yielded to him. We want God to do those things in our lives. Amen. Amen. All right. Go back to Zechariah 4. I'll give you the last thing. Dealing with the two anointed ones, Brother John. <laughs> I find it interesting. I was talking, we were talk, Brother John and I were talking. The, the importance of the number two. Here we've got two anointed ones. When Jesus sent them out, he sent them two by two. In the book of Revelation, oh, when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, there was Moses and Elijah. In the book of Revelation, we see two anointed ones that come down for, on the earth and they preach the gospel for those and then they get killed, but then they're raised up again. It just seems two, 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 two. And, and what we have here is, is, is Zachariah is asking a question. Look at verse 11. He says, Then I answered and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side? Now, what comes from olive trees? Olive. What comes from olives? Oil. Oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit or the anointing. All right. The anointing of God. Verse 12, and as I answered again, he said unto me, what be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, knowest thou not what these be? And I said, no, my Lord. Then said he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. This is, this is just my opinion on what's taking place here. I believe the two anointed ones in the life of Zerubbabel were Haggai and Zechariah. The anointed prophets, and we'll have a look at something in a minute. But then you've got you've got even in the local church today. Let, let me just say this: I think any local New Testament church that is going to to grow and function needs to have anointed leadership, and not just one. I understand the, the need for a senior pastor or a lead pastor or whatever the term is today, I, I understand that. But if we're to look at the Bible, we see in New Testament churches that there were pastors. In our movement, that's not really promoted. If you're relying on me, I'm limited. But if there were two, there's more. If there's three, there's, you know, you understand what I'm saying? So it's not just a one-man band. Even in the book of Acts, when we see uh, uh, things taking place, it seemed good unto the elders and the Holy Ghost. And we see that throughout the book of Acts in the church of Jerusalem or the church of Antioch. There's, there's what we call today a leadership team. Now, does there got to be a leader? Yeah, we, are, we understand all of that. But what we see here is the necessity, or we should see the necessity of anointed leadership. 
And I say anointed leadership because in, in, in what I see today is a lack of anointed leadership. And what you, how, you, how you evaluate that is, is that through these two men, notice what it says here, verse 12. These be two olive branches which through the golden pipes empty the golden oil. There, there's got to be giving out of, there's got to be anointed leading or anointed preaching, anointed teaching. And how do you equate that? Well, people getting saved, people getting healed. The life of God flows through that sort of thing. Come on. But we are generally speaking, seeing a move away from that sort of stuff. I don't want to come to church and just give you a little talk. I don't want to come and even tickle your ear. I want, to, I want to preach the word. I want to preach Amen. the gospel. I want to preach Christ. I want to preach Amen. the cross. Everything that Jesus preached the word, he says, preach the word. And to preach, listen, uh, I know everybody's different. You've got two loud mouths here, honestly. We're not quiet at all. I'm always being told off at home, oh, be quiet, be quiet. I'm naturally loud, but preaching is to herald, it's to make yeah. a noise. It's, yeah. He says, lift up your voice like a trumpet and cry aloud. Amen. Amen. But today, you just want to, hey, just come around and let me give you a little talk and all this sort of stuff. And, and it's like, eh. <laughs> sorry. Oh. <laughs> anyway, I want you to go to... Um, all right, very quickly. I know it's nearly time. It's 11.30. I want you to go to the book of Ezra. Very quickly, very quickly. <laughs> well, gee, I mean, there was a lukewarm church in Laodicea and Jesus said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. It's like it, it made Jesus sick. And I'm sure there are some churches today. I hope not ours, but who knows? It <laughs> could make him sick. Look at Ezra, look at Ezra chapter 3. Verse 10, and when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets. You know, I really wanted to preach a little bit about that. How the, the <laughs> anyway, no, I'm not going to go there. And the Levites, the sons of Asaph, look at this, with symbols to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And when they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because he is good for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. You know, I, I tell you, can I just say something? A, a church should be a place where you can come and make some noise. <laughs> man, there was shouting and praising and man, they just didn't come to church with a holy hush. They were excited about what's taken place. Amen. He is good and his mercy endures forever. I tell you, aren't you glad that God is good and his mercy endures? That ought to cause you to shout. That ought to make you come to church and praise God a little bit. I know we don't have a piano player. I was talking to the Lord about that again this t just today. Well, why don't we have a piano? Even if we don't have any music, we can still shout and praise the Lord. Amen. Look at this, verse 12. But many of the priests, the Levites, the chief of the fathers, who were ancient men... That had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people, for the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. Man, alive, that is a church service I want to go to. Look at chapter, uh, look at chapter 4 now, and look at verse number 5. The enemy comes on the scene and they hired counsellors against them to frustrate their purpose. Now, at here, the purpose was the rebuilding of the temple, right? Look at verse number 24, chapter 4. Then ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased unto the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Chapter 5, verse 1. Then the prophets, Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Ido prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel even unto them. Then rose up Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Joshua the son of Josedach and began to build the house of God which is at Jerusalem and with them were the prophets of God helping them. Folks do you see the necessity of anointed leadership? Uh, I, we don't have it here because I don't have an office but I've never been an office guy. 
I, but that today there's so many men that just want to sit in their office all day and not be out helping the people. You know, it's like, oh, and we go in there. Anyway, I'm, I'm not, I won't start on all of that. <laughs> The frustration. Go with me again. Go, go to the book of Haggai, the book of Haggai, which is near Zach, just before Zechariah. All right. The work had ceased. The prophets came. Oh, thank the Lord for the prophets. They come on and they 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 help. They stirred. If you go home today, mad, glad, or sad, at least something's been stirred in you. Amen. Look at uh, Haggai chapter 1, verse 12, very quickly. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel. The spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did the work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. That's what people need today. They need to be stirred up a little bit. Amen. Amen. I know it takes different sorts of preaching and, 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 and some people are this way and some are this way. But I like to get a big stick and stir. Stir the people up. Stir you up into action. Stir you up into, hey, the Lord is with us. We can do anything if God is with us. Yeah. That's what he's talking about right here. But I want to finish with this. I want to finish with this. Because if we just focus on the rebuilding of bricks and mortar, we've missed it. All right. Do you know that there is a purpose that God has designed for us that Satan wants to stop? He wants to frustrate. It's found in Revelation. Last verse, I'm, and I'm done, all right? Last verse. Go to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. In Ezra's day, remember there was symbols, there was praising, there was shouting, there was joy. What, 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 where was all that aimed at? It was aimed at God. And then the enemy frustrated the purpose. And notice when the purpose was frustrated, everyone went silent. Come on. Everyone went silent. There was no praising, no joy, no shouting. Everyone's just, oh, the enemies come on the scene, blah, 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 whatever. Have a look at Revelation chapter 4. You want to know what your purpose is? Look at verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Amen. Do you know... That God gets pleasure when you and I worship, praise, rejoice, shout, glorify. That's exactly the purpose that God created us to do. Amen. And if we're not careful, we allow the enemy to frustrate the purpose. Because if we go silent, guess who gets louder? The enemy, the devil, yep. the devil's crowd. Why is it the devil's crowd always seems to have the loudest voice? Where's the voice of God's people? Where's the praise? Where's the shout? If we can't do it in our church, and by the way, let me just say this, it should not just be confined to these four walls. Right. We ought to, in the car, I don't care if people are looking at me and they think, you are weird. I want to praise the Lord if I'm in the car, if I'm at home, wherever I am, and the Spirit of God moves. I want to shout, I want to praise, I want to sing. Amen. And if you're not careful, I might throw in a dance step or two. <laughs> All right, in the privacy of my own home. <laughs> but the necessity of anointed leadership, they stirred up the people yeah. to fulfill the purpose of God. Yeah. Yeah. But what seest thou? What seest thou? What's your vision of Heritage Baptist Church? In 2020. What does it mean to you? Is it precious? I hope it is. It's precious to the Lord. And ought to be precious to us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father we love you. We thank you for your goodness and blessing to us. Lord I pray that the message this morning. Would be thought upon. And Holy Spirit of God. That you would work in our hearts and lives.
Father, bless us as we go our way. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for, again, the Gillam family being here. What a blessing to have them worshipping with us today. Send them on your way with your blessing, we pray, as I head back to Townsville for Brother Jerome. Thank you for him being with us today. Bless him, we pray. And for all of us, Lord, as we go our way, may we lift up our voice in praise and adoration and joy and shout unto the Lord our God. Pray for those who are not well in our church, Lord. We've mentioned them already. We pray, Lord God, that you would just touch their lives, their body, and heal them, we pray. And we ask these things in that powerful name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, God bless you.